Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is Wacky and Weird Wednesday. We are looking at all the weird animal people doing stupid things and AI being AI news here on Before Coffee. I hope everyone had a good Tuesday because I sure did from all that good news yesterday. So make sure to show up every Tuesday at least so you can get that good news. Yeah. But and but Wednesdays are always fun because we can look at that goofy news. So let's go ahead and get into our headlines. Today on Before Coffee. New Zealand man film trying to body slam an orca in actions described as idiotic. And crickets swarm towns in the West and a West Virginia uh, political candidate is bitten by snakes. Two Galician businessmen confessed that they sold fake hydro-alcoholic gel to hospitals during confinement. And Colorado State is preparing for its stinky corpse flower to bloom and a cat earns a degree. In AI news, OpenAI halts using ChatGPT's Sky Voice after Scarlett Johansson said it was eerily like hers. And AI can detect sarcasm now. Great. And it's National Biomusical Instrument Day. So get yourself in tune on May 22nd, 2024 in Before Coffee. Cool. Lots of great stories coming up. Or let's start with this first one, which of course, it's Wacky Wednesday, so we have to talk about people doing weird things with animals, to animals, or at animals. And this New Zealand man tried body slamming an orca because I guess he had a death wish. The Department of Conservation fined the 50-year-old after seeing footage of the stunt on social media and described his behavior as blatant example of stupidity. They're not fining him because they don't want him to slam body slam orcas. They're they're finding him because they don't want anyone else body slamming orcas. <laughs> because we're we're all sheep and somebody will see that and say, yo, I want to try body slamming an orca too. This is from Eva Corlett from The Guardian. The actions of a New Zealand man filmed jumping off a boat in what appears to be an attempt to body slam an orca have been described as shocking and idiotic by the country's Department of Conservation. In a video shared to Instagram in February, a man can be seen jumping off the edge of a boat into the sea off the coast of Devonport in Auckland, in what appears to be a deliberate effort to touch or body slam the orca, the department said. He leaps into the water very close to a male orca as a calf swims by, while somebody on the boat board of the boat films it. Others can be heard laughing and swearing in the background. As he swims back to his boat, he yells, I touched it! And he asks, did you get that? And then attempts to touch the orca again. Hayden Loper, a principal investigator at the department, said the 50-year-old man showed a reckless disregard for his own safety and that of the orca. The video speaks for itself. The shocking and absolutely idiotic behavior, he said. The department received a tip-off. Yo, dude, you need to check out this video of this guy in Auckland being an idiot. They received a tip-off of the video from a couple of concerned people who had seen the footage on social media. Working with police, the department identified the man and handed him a $600 infringement fine. It's very clear breach of the Marine Mammals Protection Act. Orca are classified as whales under conservation legalization. It is illegal to swim with or disturb or harass any marine mammal, he said. Looper said often people breached the act by accident, for example, taking a jet ski too close to a marine mammal. But in this case, it was a real blatant example of stupidity. For him to jump into the water deliberately and swim up to Orca, and to make sure that it was filmed, it defies belief. Social media is a double-edged sword when it comes to protecting marine life. On one hand, it can help alert the department to incidents, it can also act as a catalyst for poor behavior. It was a deliberate attempt to get likes and views on social media. What's also disappointing is not just the actions of the individual, but those in the boat. Here's a bit of pack mentality and they're encouraging this behavior. Exactly why you need to find people for doing these things. 
New Zealand's orca can be found throughout the country's coastline, but with a population of just 150 to 200, they are deemed nationally critical and face high risk of extinction. The orca appeared to escape injury, but Hannah Hendricks, the Department of Marine Technical Advisor, said jumping into the water on top of any dolphin or small whale could easily damage their sensitive fins. A person jumping into water could startle animals, she said, and cause it to collide with a propeller or a keel. Interacting with polyps can disrupt the, their natural behaviors like resting, feeding, and socializing, which can have long-term impacts on survival and breeding success. While repeated disturbances may lead to animals avoiding an area, she said. In particular, disturbance of a pod with a calf presents a risk of separation of the calf from the rest of the pod. The calf is still relying on its mum for milk. This can end up with the calf starving, stranding, or ultimately dying. So this is serious, but it's also weird. Because why? Just what? Maybe he was drunk. I have no idea. But just like what in your mind is like, yo, is that an orca? Let me jump on top of it real quick. You know? <laughs> it's the first thought that occurs to me. Okay. Well, I guess you and him share a similar brain cells. <laughs> Definitely want to. <laughs> well, that was sarcastic. That was sarcasm. Okay. Okay, so more weird news. I was looking for a weird video clip. Couldn't find one. Um, let's look at the western United States and the cricket swarms. This is from UPI.com, Monica Danielle EcuWeather.com. In recent years, cricket outbreaks across the West have only worsened, and the climate crisis might be partially to blame. While cicadas invade much of the eastern United States, swarms of crickets are taking over towns in the west. Some roads in Idaho have been so covered with crickets that maintenance crews had to bring in a tractor to clear them off. Our maintenance crews see a little bit of everything in the south, southwest Idaho, uh, says a state highway patrol native to North America. Mormon crickets, which can grow up to two inches in length, get their name get their name in the 1800s when the giant insects ruined the fields of Mormon settlers. The insects are not true crickets, though. They're actually shield-backed, short-winged katydids that resemble fat grasshoppers and cannot fly, according to the University of Nevada, Reno's College of Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Natural Resources. In the recent years, all breaks across the West have only worsened and the climate crisis might be partially to blame. Drought conditions, drought conditions encourage Mormon cricket outbreaks, which according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture can result in billions of insects and cause major economic and ecological losses to rangeland and cropland. In large numbers, their feeding can contribute to soil erosion, poor water quality, nutrient depleted soil, soils, and potentially cause damage to range and cropland ecosystems. Typically, these flightless insects travel together, covering at least a quarter mile a day as they devour vegetation, countless crops are damaged, and natural patterns like erosion, water runoff, and nuclear nutrient cycling are abruptly changed, the USDA said. They cover our homes, buildings, and when, when run over, will bloody, bloody our roads and leave horrible smell from sitting in the summer sun. Uh... Nevada resident Kyra Adams told Storyful, imagine you just want to go to church and this is what you see. So the crickets taking over the towns in the West. In other weird news involving nature, a West Virginia candidate hospitalized after being bitten by snakes while removing campaign signs. This is from Charleston, West Virginia from AP News. A candidate for West Virginia Secretary of State said he has been hospitalized for a copperhead snake bite sustained while removing electric campaign signs. Doug Scaffs said he was bitten in the left leg and right foot Wednesday near U.S. Route 119 in Danville, U.S. News reports, news outlets reported. Scaff told West Virginia Radio Network Metro News that passersby called for medical assistance. A South Charleston resident said he expects to be in the hospital in Charleston for a few days. Scaff ran in the Secretary of State as a Republican on Tuesday and official returns. Scaff finished second to Chris Warner. 
Staff, staff resigned his House of Delegate seat in former Kanawha County last September after stepping down as a Chamber's Democratic leader in August. Oh, he can't make up his mind what party he's at. He announced in October he's switching to the GOP and running for Secretary of State. There you go. The snake saw you do that, and you switched parties to the party that wants to take away all your rights. Way to go, moron. Switch parties and get bit. Anyway. <laughs> Scaff served on the House from 2009. That's my little editorial, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of a... Kind of a... Um, snakes snakes are, are just trying to figure out, why would you do that? Why would you do that? He is yeah, the president exactly. of HD Media, which owns the Charleston Gazette Mall and several other state newspapers. Of course, the state snakes don't know anything. They're just responding to stimulus, to a threat. But yeah, it's, it comes a buddy switch from Democrat to Republican. Ooh, ooh, no, no principles whatsoever is what he got. So snake, what do they say? What's the joke about snakes and lawyers? Why don't snakes bite lawyers? professional courtesy well mm -hmm. um there's your story snakes do bite politicians though back to you politicians are politizing again in wacky new ways <laughs> well he got bit he just basically got bit he wasn't doing anything yeah. he was taking down his signs he wasn't any nothing about any of his policies nothing about no, what he I'm does for a living saying, or anything. i'm just, just using i'm just using like politicking as like a never mind don't worry about it Pol politicians politic it's not it's just it wasn't that deep <laughs> okay well okay it was a failed segue is that what you're saying yeah all, all right. right well you got you got to try them out uh, anyway well i hope you didn't go to this hospital in i think it was in portugal because you may have been dealing with some fake hydroalcoholic gel because two people from Glacia we are so, was, was selling fake gel to hospitals. This is from Eliza Lois on El Pais. Health material scams multiplied during the coronavirus pandemic and affected in all autonomous communities, although not in all cases, the frauds detected have had consequences for their crimes. One of the most striking public health cases was detected in the province of A Coruna when in 2020 the Civil Guard discovered a laboratory in an old chicken farm where thousands of liters of product was sold in hospitals as hydroalcoholic gel, which was actually adulterated. Oh, wait. It was just brandy. Instead of it actually being hydroalcoholic gel, it was actually just brandy they're selling brandy in bottles i guess here you go this will fix all your problems mm -hmm. would you like some sugar because that's the problem with you can't just use normal drinking alcohol because it has sugar in it so you're just gonna get infections from that the mass amount of the fraud were two residents of the corona town of boiro 19,000 inhabitants who were going to get be tried who are going to be tried in the sixth section of the court of Akaruna, based in Santiago. Though to official distributors, these businessmen placed the fake gel in hospitals and health centers throughout Spain. Oh, sorry, it wasn't Spain. Why did I think it was in... I think it was because this article is coming out of Lisbon, so I thought it was in Portugal. Paste the fake gel in hospitals and health centers throughout Spain during the month of April 2020, the worst moment of the pandemic, taking advantage of the urgent need for product. The hearing did not take place when... Jose Antonio S. and Juan Yes S. accepted an agreement in accordance with the prosecutor's office, which requested a sentence of almost nine years in prison for each one for continuous crime of fraud and another for manufacturing, storage, and marketing of health products with potential risks to people's health. Brandy is not gonna kill COVID, sorry. The advance of this agreement, which implicitly implies the confession of facts, will prevent both fraudsters from going to prison after paying a fine of 17,520 euros each and with the condition that do not commit crimes again in the next two years. Do not commit a single crime in the next two years or you're going to jail for nine. The compliance trial has closed with a sentence of two years and three months for the crimes of continued fraud and another against public health. 
The accused have recognized the motive. They both use the commercial firm Quimiscalza to enrich themselves while thousands of people died every day in Spain and disinfectant products were scarce on the market. They have accepted the prosecutor's account of the events in his indictment, which dates back to months of confinement when the accused, knowing shortage and demand for the product, agreed to take advantage of that situation. With a chemical company as a cover, they produced a hydroalcoholic gel without any administrative authorization for the manufacturer of, this, of these products, neither as biocides nor as cosmetics. In any case, the actions carried out by the accused were focused on the use of product manufactured for the veridicidial purposes, whose authorization must be granted by the Spanish Medicines Agency, said Santander Prosecutor's Office, and they were not given any authorization to create any sort of med gel. Both involved former partners in a chicken farm in the town of Boiro acted with the intention of obtaining illicit benefit and with the full awareness that they were not telling the truth, the public ministry states. The investigation has found that the defendants were fully aware they were flagrantly failing to comply with requirements of legislation applicable to these products in terms of the facilities used to produce them. The gel lacked the minimum requirement amount of ethanol 70%, which they could have probably... I don't know. They could, you can make alcohol with 70%. The component with the defendants replaced with liquor with a consequent danger to health of the users of the product. It was, there was 10,000 liters of this fake product. The defendants set up the clandestine laboratory wow. in the old poultry warehouse in which they manufactured, labeled, and stored the gel already prepared for distribution. In police actions, a total of 6,000 liters of gel that were on sale and another 4,000 liters of the same product prepared to go on market were seized. Health centers, pharmacies, hotel establishments, fishmongers, workshops, and cafeterias are the most affected by the fraud. The analysts of these samples sent by the researchers to the chemistry service of the National Institute of Toxology conclude that they contained a tiny amount of ethyl alcohol and a high amount of methanol. The defendants were not <laughs> were those who sent the product through transportation services. The first problem arose with the pharmacies that began to complain about the labeling, illegaling because it lacked an expiration date, barcode, batch number, and a responsible manufacturer. So the external appearance of the products was changed, but the content remained the same. Then the buyers carried out analysis of the product upon verifying that it did not meet the required health requirements. They requested the defense to return the, the money given. It is not clear from the investigation whether the money was ever refunded, although it was found that the defective shipments were left in the warehouse of the transport companies. Faced with these problems, defendants decided to distribute the product to smaller business owners who won't be as suspicious, I guess. A large part of these buyers <laughs> could never use or nor resell the gel due to its storing. Strong smell of liquor, the prosecutor states in the indictment. While on the label of the gel, the manufacturer appeared as Pimiscalza, or later Lo Lucas. In the last invoices, the defendants used the commercial name of Galicia Quimicos, with an address in Ribiria, a Coruna, a place where this company did not exist. In seven of the invoices located in the judicial police, Sales for the amounts exceeding 24,000 euros appeared. Although the warehouse used a laboratory was sealed, used as a laboratory was sealed in August 2020, one of the accused broke the police cordon and seized the manufactured container that contained the un, uh, the adult, er, adult, adulterated, I guess adulterated, hydroalcoholic gel, and that were seized by the court. He did it to sell them directly to a different commercial or hospital establishment. So he's like, oh, we got there. They, they got us. We got caught. But I'm still going to break in and keep selling. Even though we already basically <laughs> got caught, we're just going to keep selling it. Using fake labels of both the manufacturer and the disinfectant power of the product with claims that contain 96% alcohol, there's evidence that at least 15 small businessmen were defrauded in the second shipment while the accused were already charged with fraud. They just couldn't help themselves. Oh, we uh, maybe we can make some more money. <laughs> Gotta move product. We're, the product's already made, we might as well try it to complete fraud right. somebody else. <laughs> For the prosecutor's office, the events described are classified as a crime and fraud in competition with the falsification of a commercial document for which they requested a sentence of five and a half years in prison and a fine of 10 months at a rate of 10 euros daily fee. 
Okay, so they are gonna be charged 10 euros daily for 10 months. Okay. Which is... Uh... 300 or something? 3,000. 3,000. The public ministry added another two years and nine months. I forgot a zero. Public ministry added another two years and nine months in prison for the crime of manufacturing, storing, and marketing health products that represent a potential public health risk. Both defendants posed a long experience as long experienced chemist. They had admitted that what they sold was a gel with a high dysfunction power was actually a liquid mixed with liquor, liquid liquor that did not have such antiseptic properties and that they made to it to enrich themselves. When the health crisis broke out and faced with the acute lack of hydroalcoholic gel in Spain, the Spanish Medicines Agency authorized the use of ethyl alcohol to produce the disinfectant, as long as it achieved the minimum properties for it to be effective. The vents admit that they quickly saw the business and used the homemade liquor as raw material, which only has 30% alcohol, far from the minimum 70%, and it was also diluted, so it was just water, really. The company was fictitious, so it lacked authorization from any medicine, the Spanish medicines agency, to produce the gel, while which was distributed in false, vast numbers, references that complicated the civil guards' investigations. Uh, just put a bunch of random numbers in there. Batch of uh, 554567. Uh, yeah. Jose Antonio S. was in charge of manufacturing gel, while Juan S. focused on sales work to place the merchandise. One, the one baptizes Operation Quimigel was directed by Court Number 2 of Riberia. So there's your long but wacky story about being fraudsters and selling fake... Snake oil. Snake yeah. oil. That, snake oil. That's where your segue. Up. Yeah. That should have been your segue from snake bites to snake oil. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. well, I couldn't think of it. <laughs> it's <laughs> early in the but, day. Yeah. There's your, there's your snake oil salesman who just, I, my, the part that got me was that, you know what? Let's continue frauding people while we're currently under an investigation for fraud. <laughs> what? Is, just, okay. I mean, they're already Stay. dumb to begin with, but they just got dumber as we kept going. Yeah, we're doing a plant and animal theme today. But there's your snake bill. Yep. Uh, by the way, I sent you a video. I sent you a video. I got the video of the hamsters. All right. So more of our plant and animal theme today. The Vermont University is giving a at an honorary degree. This is from AP, but I found it on several news sources. A Vermont University has bestowed the honorary degree of Doctor of Litter at your, this is a poor pun, Litter, L-I-T-T-R E-R, L-I-T-T-E-R as in kitty litter, Doctor of Litter at your, on Dr. Max the Cat, litter. a beloved member of its community ahead of student's graduation on Saturday. Vermont State University's Castleton campus is honoring the feline for not not for his mousing or napping, but for his friendliness. Max the Cat has been an affectionate member of the Castleton family for years, the school said on Facebook post. The popular tabby lives in a house with his human family on the street that leads to the main entrance of the campus. So he decided that he would go up on campus and just he just started hanging out with the college students and they love him. Owner Ashley Dow said Thursday. He's been socializing on campus for about four years and students get excited when they see him. They pick him up and take selfies with him and even likes to go on tours with the prospective, prospective students that meet at a building across from the family's house, she said. I don't even know how he knows to go, but he does, Dow said, and then he'll follow them on their tour. The students refer, refer to Dow as Max's room and the, gradu the graduates who return to town sometimes ask her how Max is doing. I'm sorry, the students refer to Dao as Max's mom, not Max's okay. room. Okay. Okay, it makes no sense, okay. Can't read. Anyway, Max won't be participating in the graduation, though his degree will be delivered to Dao later. There is your cat news, where they said it was five to seven minutes. There was no way that was five to seven minutes. <laughs> Maybe you're supposed it, to look at the pictures? And right. like there's a video you're supposed to watch of the cat running across campus. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe they assume I'm in remedial reading. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess you could always other, talk slower. <laughs> other plant and animal news is from Ben Hooper of UPI. 
Colorado State is preparing for the first blooming of its corpse flower, a plant famous for its rotting flesh odor. 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 Colorado State University is inviting members of the public to come experience a nuclei, uniquely, are you nuclei? It's just new word I just invented. Experience a uniquely smelly spectacle, the first blooming of its corpse flower. The university said plant growth. The university said plant growth facilities manager Tammy Brenner brought the pungent plant named Cosmo to the school in 2016. And after seven years of careful rearing in the College of Agricultural Sciences Conservatory, Cosmo is preparing to bloom for the first time. Cosmo came out of dormancy around three weeks ago and we didn't expect anything exciting, Brenner said in the news release. But then two weeks ago, it started looking a little bit more full, a little bit more plump. It started growing and shooting out some stalks, and we realized something really big was about to happen. Amorphous titanium, or commonly known as the corpse flowers, due to the unique rotting smell they emit during blooming. The flowers expected to begin its bloom on Saturday, but Brenner cautioned that the exact date won't be known until the bloom begins. The bloom is only expected to last two to three days, and Cosmo won't bloom again for another three to five years. It's a rare occasion, a big deal, because it'll be the first bloom of the corpse flower here at CSU, Brenner's. The conservancy will remain open, will be open to the public for corpse flower viewings and smellings from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. each day of the bloom. So go get your stink on, go over to Colorado State University and Smell this corpsey flower. Back to you on mm, Weird Ones. The I love, you know, that's the not the best smell, corpses. Uh, obviously, it's there to attract flies, right? <laughs> and I flies are what distribute like that, the. It's all about pollination. I can I can vividly remember the smell of corpses because of, well. The summertime or the springtime, there's always dead animals everywhere. You know, birds fall out of trees, oh, eat some yeah. mice, and then they don't. Walk, they just you leave walk them. past they, the ditch. They don't bury them. You yeah. know, cats who find mice don't bury the mice. They just leave them there to like rot in the sun, and then oh, something died. Well, something well, rotten died. <laughs> you're smelling as methane, but I wonder what the corpse flower's actually chemical process is to create that smell. It might not be a creation of methane, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. They don't they don't explain that. But again, well, it's, it's all part methane, of nature just, and reproduction. It's probably probably similar to how plants make oxygen, right? It's just part of their photosynthesis. Right. They have all the ingredients and they combine it together to make Well, they, they do release methane. they do release carbon. I mean, I mean, plants release our oxygen and consume carbon, so that would be the opposite, wouldn't it? If it's releasing methane, what is it consuming to create the methane? Dead flies? Yeah, I guess so. More protein, eh. some, some sort of protein eh, in the fly. tracks some dead flies like and eats them. The right chemical compounds. But I think the flies also serve in the pollination process because they don't all get eaten. Some of them fly onto another, theoretically, stinky plant somewhere else and pollinate it right i don't know not a biologist not a botanist there's your stinky plant news though it doesn't it says explain there's like a there's news articles about why it smells but there's not an actual yeah. article about how it smells <laughs> how does it, it just do does this? all, fl oh, all flowers go. smell right all flowers have a smell. This is this one just has one that's repulsive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I got I got somebody yeah. who's a scientist here. What makes the corp? This is from no, the you... New York Times from 2018. What makes the corp flower that just bloomed in New York Botanical Garden smell so bad? The main chemical that makes giant bloom of the Amorphous titanum, also called the Titan Arm. So. Odorous when it first emerges has been identified by the Japanese researchers it? as sulfur compound called the methyl trisulfide. So that's three sulfur, and di means two. So there's two meth methyl uh, methane, three sulfide. Mm. Sulfide I think means it's a chemical compound. I 
forget what iod means, but well, I wonder if it produces I the was, sulfur. I got or a it D needs in chemistry, clip. and and I haven't been chemistry since 2010. Okay. So you know, I'm trying my best. Here. Okay, well, I guess but we'll there do you the go. Next Dimethyl story, trifos yeah. is, is a just smells like boiled cabbage. That's what it comes out of. That's boiled cabbage smells like that. So it's not the only thing to make uh, that chemical when it when in existence, I guess. Yeah, so there you go. Whenever you cook broccoli or cook cabbage, you're also smelling. I wonder if it makes the sulfur. But I love the smell of broccoli mm. and cabbage boiling. So I guess I wouldn't mind the. It's not exactly flour. a corpse. It's not exactly a corpse smell then. It probably Very smells different. more. It's probably just more dank in the botanical garden or something. It just smells more dank. Dankier smell. Or maybe maybe there was just some guy named Dank that died. And, <laughs> smells like him. I don't know. Mr. Mr. Corpse <laughs> discovered the flower and they called it Corpse Flower. <laughs> Mr. Corpse. It's a really stinky flower. <laughs> stinky, stinky, stinky. All, All right. right, man. Let's go into a weird segue about AI. That's right. We are looking at the drama that's been happening. I think happened or oh, started over the weekend, but it's finally concluded um, yesterday. On the 21st. The maker of the popular AI chatbot ChatGPT stopped using the voice that sounded eerily similar to that of the actress Scarlett Johansson. Johansson. This is from your news next. OpenAI paused one of its ChatGPT voices after questions were raised about how it was created, with actress Scarlett Johansson saying it sounded eerily similar to her own voice. Johannesson, who voiced an AI assistant in the 2013 movie Her, wrote in a statement that OpenAI CEO Sam Altman had approached her. That's where he got, you know, that's where he went wrong. He approached her in September to voice a chat GBT to bridge a gap between creatives and tech companies, but she declined the offer. When I heard the release demo, I was shocked, angered and in disbelief that Mr. Altman would pursue a voice that sounded so eerily similar to mine that my closest friends and news outlets could not tell the difference. Johannesson said, OpenAI reluctantly agreed to take down the Sky Voice after she hired lawyers who wrote Altman letters asking her about the process by which the company came up with the voice. Johannesson added, San Francisco-based company first launched voice capabilities for ChatGPT in September. Last week, OpenAI unveiled the latest model update ChatGPT 4.0 which it says only works. Oh, it says which it says works fast across text, audio, and video. Altman even appeared to reference a 2013 movie in which Johannesson played an AI assistant posting the word "her" on the social media platform Twitter on the day of GPT 4.0's unveiling. This guy is just a terrible liar. Just <laughs> I'm gonna ask her, and then when she denies me, I'm gonna do it anyways, and then I'm going to make a reference to her. No one will ever figure it out. It's not an imitation. In a blog post on Monday, which was uh, May 20th, OpenAI admitted, attempted, sorry, OpenAI attempted to clarify how the voices for the AI models were created. Each of the voices, Breeze, Cove, Ember, Juniper, and Sky, are sampled from voice actors who we partnered with to create them. The company said, adding that they had submissions from hundreds of voice and screen actors. They went on to explain that AI voices should not deliberately mimic a celebrity's distinct voice because they can't do make one themselves, so they have to mimic something. Sky's voice is not an imitation of Scarlett Johansson, but belongs to a different professional actress using her natural speaking voice that I'm sure they hired because it sounds a lot like Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> OpenAI has said, Correct their privacy, we cannot share the names of our voice talents, they added. Yeah, let's not have the, the woman get yelled at because I'm sure that she will get bullied on the internet just for sounding like Scarlett Johansson. People are weird. And more AI news. This is from Johnny Walfitz, also on your news culture. Oh, isn't AI so clever? We're just so happy that some research in the Netherlands have built an AI sarcasm detector. Guilty! Reading the room perfectly for how we feel about artificial intelligence, the speech technology lab at the University of Groningen has finally created a program able to discern the tone of voice in sarcasm. It might be the lowest form of wit, but the AI is an impressive development through displaying how technology can understand more subjective aspects of text. 
in a presentation to the Acoustal Society of America and the Canadian Acoustal Association, the researchers explained how the prevalence of sarcasm in human written text means that without AI properly detecting it, there would be huge gaps in potential capabilities of AI text comprehension. Previous AI sarcasm detectors only used one parameter. This new technology combines many methods. We extract the acoustic parameters such as pitch, speaking rate, and energy from speech. Then we used automatic speech recognition to describe the speech in text for sentiment, sentiment analysis, said Chi Wan Hao. Oh, I said that like in Dutch, but it's also Chinese. Chi Wan Gao. <laughs> Next, we assigned emoticons to each speech segment, reflecting its emotional content. By integrating these multimodal cues into a machine and learning and learning algorithm, our approach leverages the combined strengths of auditory and textual information along with emoticons for our comprehensive analysis, Gao explained. The team relied on the Mustard Multimodal Sarcasm Detection Dataset. Love that. Database of sarcasm examples in popular TV shows to teach their AI about sarcasm through clips from The Big Bang Theory and Friends. Why didn't they... What about like a British show, The Masters of Sarcasm? Hello? <laughs> like two American shows. What about like an actual good show? Uh, I guess it would have been too smart if they used a British show. There are a range of expressions and gestures people use to highlight sarcastic elements in speech, said Gao. These need to be better integrated in our project. In addition, we would like to include more languages and adopt developing sarcasm recognition techniques. Tons of language is one of... Tone, sorry, tone of language is one of the more complex elements of text. Many people find it difficult to detect sarcasm when it's written down without any audio-visual cues. Not you, though. You're too far, far too smart for that, aren't you? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of 50-50 on this. Sometimes I get it instantly, and sometimes I'm like, is this person being serious? But it also depends on the speaker, because some speakers don't know the very small intricacies to, intricacies to internet speaking and basically leading on that I'm being sarcastic, right? There's a way when you type on the internet that you can lead on that you're being sarcastic or you can lead on that you're not serious. Like, don't put a period at the end of your sentence. I think and this might be only a millennial thing, but for my existence on the internet, if you put a period at the end of your sentence, you are super serious. You know, that is the, as serious mm. as you can possibly on the internet, okay? What about an I don't like you, point. period. They freaking vehemently hate you. You know, that's what that means. Uh. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh. Sarcasm is more like, you can also do emotes for sure. I think there's this kind of you thing. Can also right do, you can do the rolls eyes thing yeah. at the end, right? The rolls eye emote. Yeah. Or, or you can do a sarcasm in parentheses tag, yeah. like spell the word or another in thing brackets, you can do is sarcasm. S. Yeah. You can do slash S and then people know that you're being sarcastic. The slash S, this isn't real. One of the, uh, this, that's more of a newer thing on the internet, doing the slash uh. S. Another researcher on the team, Dakar Nayak, has suggested that while the project will have benefits for improving human AI text interactions, it also could have applications detecting abuse and hate speech. The development of sarcasm recognition technology can benefit other researchers' domains using sentiment analysis and emotion recognition, says Gao. She continued, Traditionally, sentiment analysis mainly focuses on text and is developed for applications such as online hate speech detection and customer opinion mining. Emotion recognition based on speech can be applied to AI-assisted healthcare. Sarcasm recognition technology that applies a multimodal approach is insightful to these research domains. So instead of having, I guess, a bunch of people working in office data mining to find out, you know, looking for hate speech and customer opinion, they can just use AI to do that. And that's something I can approve AI doing. Great. So <laughs> all the things they're trying to replace people with, this is the one. It's got to have some do. value. Yeah. That's the end of my, uh, my article about AI and it has, Scarlett Johansson. Yes. Right on. Okay, so it's the history then. Oh, you're disconnecting. 1913. German. I'm disconnecting. What? What happened? 
Okay, I think you're back now. Sorry. Say that all again. This day in history. <laughs> Back in 1813, on this day, German dramatic composer Richard Wagner, or Wagner, whose operas and music had a revolutionary influence on the, the course of Western music, was born in Leipzig. In, or Leipzig, or however you pronounce that. In 1844, on this day, American painter Mary Cassatt, who is especially known for impressionist works of, of the intimate lives of Contemporary Women was born in Allegheny City, Pennsylvania. 1849, future U.S. President Abraham Lincoln was granted a patent for a boat lifting device. He was the only U.S. President to have a patent. There's a trivia for, for you. Him. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah. Never really got made any money off it, but there you go. <laughs> a boat lifting device. In 1885, French poet, novelist, and dramatist Victor Hugo died at the age of 83. He was the most one of the most important of the French Romantic writers. 1939, Adolf Hitler of Germany and Benito Mussolini of Italy signed the Pact of Steel, a full military and political alliance between their countries. So the fascists got together in 1939. 1942, Mexico entered World War II by declaring war on Germany, Italy, and Japan. Everybody was declaring war. It was a thing. 1960, one of the largest earthquakes on record struck the southern coast of Italy, killing about 5,700 people and creating seismic sea waves that caused death and destruction in distant Pacific coastal waters, notably Japan and Hawaii. So, hey... A um, a earthquake in and earthquakes are always happening. By the way, the last earthquake on record in Chile killed people in Japan and Hawaii. Isn't that crazy? In 1972, Richard Nixon arrived in Moscow, the first visit by U.S. President to the Soviet Union. In 1992, on this day, American comedian Johnny Carson, considered by many the king of late night television, made his final appearance as host of The Tonight Show. And uh, Bette Miller was his guest and she sang that Wind Beneath Your Wings song. And 2011, one of the deadliest tornadoes. Well, it's tornado season. Oh my God, there's more tornadoes this week. Maybe we'll cover them tomorrow, but uh, maybe we'll just do a weekly tornado update because they're just tornado outbreaks all over Iowa yesterday. Wiped out a town, basically. Again, another town got wiped out yesterday. But in 2011, one of the deadliest tornadoes in U.S. history, which will be a repeating theme, struck Joplin, Missouri, causing massive damage and killing some 160 people. Other, our featured event today is the year 337, Roman Emperor Constantine I baptized. On this day, in the year 337, Constantine the Great, who had practiced Christianity since his youth and sparked its growth into a world religion, be became on his deathbed the first Roman emperor to be baptized in the Christian church. And next thing you know, Rome is the head of the Catholic church. What about that? They're the head of all of Christianity. Wow. After, after being the ones who crucified Jesus. Yay. Anyway. We decided 300 years ago that was a bad thing. Now we're all Christians. <laughs> anyway, feature biography, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, British author, was born on May 22, 1859 in Edinburgh, Scotland. And he died July 7, 1930 at Crown Borough, England at the age of 71. And happy birthday to the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So that's his birthday. Other birthdays today, British actor, director, and writer Laurence Olivier is born in 1907. For some reason, they want us to remember the Unabomber's birthday. I don't care about him. He can rot in hell. He's just a piece of shit. 1946, George Best, an Irish-born football player, is born in Ireland, I guess. He says he's Irish-born. There you go. Yep. And 1987 is the birthday of Serbian tennis player Novak Djokovic, Djokovic, who was born in 1987. Happy birthday to 
Mr. Spence. <laughs> and what day is it today? National Maritime Day today. And they got a picture of a container ship from the top. Looks pretty cool. Being, un being unloaded by those giant cranes they have at the port of entry. If you want to see giant cranes, go to a port of entry. They're awesome. Anyway, National Buy a Musical Instrument Day. Don't steal a, buyer, a musical instrument. Don't borrow a my, my, uh, musical instrument. Don't even rent a musical instrument. Buy a musical instrument. And it's National Vanilla Pudding Day. Emergency Medical Services for Children Day. That seems scary. National Solitaire Day and National Craft Distillery Day. So if you make your own booze, it's your day. <laughs> Craft distillery, that's what they're calling moonshiners these days. <laughs> I'm a craft distiller. Okay, that's much better. You're selling that 99% hooch. So those are your days for today. May 22nd, 2024. Uh, that's what that's what Nash, that's oh. what your own homemade. Your own homemade booze is called hooch. That's what it's called, yeah. hooch. Anyway, Before hooch. That's the short term for it. Before <laughs> hooch. There you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. This has been Allison here from the Netherlands. I hope you are going to have a weird and wacky Wednesday. Do not jump on any orca whales. Uh, say hello to your neighborhood cat, I guess. And uh, uh, don't touch the corpse flower <laughs> and don't drink the hooch and don't drink don't drink the <laughs> fake hydrochloric acid or not hydrochloric acid hydro yeah. alcoholic gel that's what that snake oil yeah. was actually was that snake yeah. oil was actually hooch right yeah, yeah. it was yeah. actually brandy the whole time yeah so well, don't put your brandy, brandy Just, in like your I said, hand hooch. sanitizer it's not gonna do anything uh, tomorrow yeah. is going to be our Thursday 13. We're going to cover 13 random things that Raj has come up with. He never tells me until it happens. Uh -oh. so he's, I don't he's even have, know. He's like, I haven't even researched that yet. So get research into If you have any research. recommendations for 13 things, go ahead and comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so you can get notified when we go live and a video goes up. And with further ado, here is your mic drop moment. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.